Ladies and gentlemen, the session will begin now. Please start making your way to the auditorium. Ladies and gentlemen, the session will begin now. Please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, the session will begin now. Please take your seats.
Ladies and gentlemen, the session will begin now. Please take your seats. Welcome back to the conference. The session about improving governance in emerging market economies, critical importance of robust institutions, will now begin. Please welcome to the stage the chair for this session, Nobunitsu Hayashi, Governor of the Japan Bank for International Cooperation. And now, please join me in welcoming on stage the speakers for this session. Larabi Jaidi, Senior Fellow at the Policy Center for the New South. <laughs> Sumai Fazi, Chairman of the Thailand Bond Market Association. <laughs> Maria Eugenia Brizuela de Avila, Director of Inversiones Vision. Jumat Ortubayev, former Prime Minister of Kyrgyzstan. <laughs> and Wajat Nag, Distinguished Fellow at the Emerging Markets Forum. <laughs> the session will close with the launch of the latest EMF publication, From Here to Denmark, The Importance of Institutions for Good Governance, by Wajat Nag and Harinder Kohli. Nobunitsu Hayashi, the floor is yours. Oh, 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 yeah, yes. <laughs> yes, good morning. So uh, now in this session, we are to talk about governance issues, which is very important. And uh, I hope this uh, session is going to be uh, the most well-governed uh, session <laughs> among the, the meetings uh, throughout uh, uh, our forum. Well, uh, well, honestly, I'm most concerned about the governance in the United States right now. Uh, there seems to be a lot of problem, although they have well-established institutions and well-established rules, but the, those rules seem to be very much outdated. Uh, the Congress doesn't know how to govern itself. Uh, the government may shut down at any time, and the presidential elections will be decided, but, but just a uh, handful states voters. So, um, I'm very, m m that, that is my most concern, honestly, at this time. But uh, luckily enough, we are not to talk about the deteriorating um, governance system in the developing, in advanced companies, as, but we are to talk about the uh, governance improvement in emerging market economies, as we are emerging market forum. And in those countries, I'm sure that there is less room for degradation, but mo more room for improvement. So that, that is uh, very good news for us. And uh, perhaps the, the most concern may I may have is the degrading uh, or whatever governance system in China, where under Xi, President Xi Jinping's very strong discipline, uh, I'm not sure if it's better governed or um, looking toward uh, more economic prosperity. The government and the structure is very, very strict, but it uh, doesn't seem to be bearing more economic fruit or economic uh, prospect for the people of China. Which leads me to a question of, uh, do we prefer uh, autocratic discipline or democratic chaos, especially as I lead the financial, official financial institution of Japan uh, to finance Japanese investment abroad. So there is, the governance issue is always very important when we uh, make decisions on our lending or investment. And governance is very important in peaceful times, but especially in difficult times. And in this world of crisis after crisis, governance does matter a lot. So um, Rajat Nag has uh, produced us a very interesting, insightful paper on 
how we can improve governance in emerging market economies and critical importance of robust institutions. And I very much agree with those uh, importances and uh, especially in this age of uh, social media, SNS, uh, which are more and more in, in influence people, what, they pe what the people believe. And what the people believe does have a lot of bearing on uh, the kind of beliefs or norms that create, that are created in the society and what it would be the basis of governance. I was talk I was having breakfast with the finance minister of Japan, Mr. Suzuki and central bank governor, Mr. Ueda, and the finance minister was complaining how the government's approval rate is very low but not as low as UK, but still very low in other G7 colleagues as well. Uh, he can only envy uh, Putin's approval rate, which is more than the majority in Russia. So people's minds and people's institutions are very much um, affected by social media now. So I, I'm very interested to hear from Rajat how you would manage the critical importance of institutions in this age of uh, the crisis after crisis and the proliferation of populism and social media. So before we open uh, the discussion with, uh, with our panelists, we first turn to Rajat to make uh, the presentation on uh, the very important book that we are to be launching later. Rajat, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hayashi san uh, I present this book today on behalf of Farinder and myself. Uh, and whatever the outcome of the book may be, uh, we just have had a wonderful time preparing it. <laughs> Thank you, Harinder. Uh, let me begin by giving a bit of a context of the name from here to Denmark particularly because when the book sort of, you know, was announced on Amazon, I wasn't sure if I should be flattered or not. It appeared under the... Sorry, not at all, not at all. It appeared under the travel section. Obviously, somebody thought <laughs> it's a travel tourism book. Uh, I just hope some poor sorts didn't actually buy it on that basis, because <laughs> they certainly wouldn't find anything. Uh, but anyways, uh, let me begin uh, by saying that neither here nor Denmark <laughs> refer to any actual places themselves, okay? Uh, here is a hypothetical construct of a place where governance is poor, rule of law is not respected, and justice is delayed and often denied. Denmark, on the other hand, is where uh, justice prevails, people live in peace and security under the rule of law. Quite obviously, Denmark is the place to be, and uh, uh, Denmark is the place to be, and here is not. Now, how do we get from here to Denmark uh, an obvious prerequisite, precondition, good governance. Now, for an audience like this, I don't think we need to spend any time on discussing why good governance, okay? The challenge always is how, and I'm sure all of you, certainly myself, certainly Harinder, have faced this situation when we have lectured on the importance of good governance, when the other person said that's all very well, but how do we get there? And we then hummed and hawed and all that. So this is an attempt to do a bit more than humming and hawing. Uh, but I think it is important to reflect on one question, uh, and that is, does better governance lead to higher incomes? Or is the other way around? Because one hears this argument all the time, you know, good governance is okay, but let's get rich first. Now, there is convincing evidence that the causality is one way, from good governance to higher incomes and not the other way. And this is a 
powerful conclusion. Uh, you can't get rich first and then become honest. So the focus of our book is how to get there. I'll make five very quick points uh, and a brief conclusion. Uh, first, institutions matter. Uh, and again, how do we get good governance? The immediate answer through inclusive, robust institutions. Great, but how do we get those? Uh, I think it's therefore important to reflect that institutions are different from organizations. Organizations are also institutions, but institutions are a broader set. They're actually a set of rules, formal and informal, uh, which guide social interactions, including their enforcement arrangements. Uh, they are the rules of the game, as it were, uh, and the logos to the game in any sporting game, football or, or cricket or whatever. Now, these laws can be articulated formally as laws, rights, enshrined in the Constitution. But what we find is much more important are actually the informal rules, which guide social behavior. And as Harishisan was suggesting, they are embedded in a society's beliefs, conventions, norms, history, culture. Form, formal rules are essentially aspirational. Uh, they are an expression of the standards of social conduct a society expects to uphold. But the immediate question is, whose aspirations? And that's where politics comes in, because it is a function of those with the political power. They reflect their aspirations, their wish in those formal rules. Uh, so obviously, politics matters. However, even the world's most elegantly written constitutions, laws, rules, are, as Kaushik Basu has said, nothing but ink on paper if they're not enforced. But interestingly, that in spite of having all the formal rules in place, including enforcement mechanism, you have the Anti-Corruption Commission, you have the organizations entrusted with all of that, the same laws work in one place and doesn't work in another. And that is because implementation depends on the informal rules that I talked about. Uh, now, over the past 75 years, I think, all over the world, most countries have the formal institutions in place. They have the constitutions, they have the organizations, but Efforts to those strengthen those must continue, no question. But we believed that it is the informal institutions that we should look at much more deeply than we usually do, and that's the first point. Institutions matter, but the informal institutions rather than the formal institutions. Point number two, human behavioral factors matter. As I said, Institutions are the rules of the game. But how well the game is played ultimately depends on the individuals and their interactions with each other. Now, Adam Smith's insight of the invisible hand was as brilliant as it was stunning. Basically he said, if each one of us act in our self-interest, somehow the invisible hand will lead us to an optimal equilibrium. We'll be better off, society will be better off. But that thinking was based on a very fundamental set and actually very demanding set of assumptions. And they essentially were that the individual is always perfectly rational, is omniscient, uh, and possesses unbounded willpower. And I think it was Richard Taylor, the Nobel Prize winning economist, who said that such a person can be described as one who can think like Albert Einstein, uh, store and process information at the speed of a supercomputer, and exercise the willpower of Mahatma Gandhi. Now, <clears throat> I don't think most of us really <laughs> possess those qualities. Uh, rather, we make decisions 
based on bounded rationality, on bounded willpower. We know we should do that, but we end up doing that anyways. Uh, and of course, bounded self-interest. We are selfish, but we also are kind at times. We're altruistic at times. Now, not that development practitioners deny the existence of this inherent contradiction of the human, i.e. us, versus the econs, the ones that Adam Smith had in mind. But we also felt that this is just too complex, human behavior is too complex to model in. And in any case, the law of large numbers will operate and they'll cancel each other out. So we can merrily go along with the assumption of perfect rationality, unbounded willpower, etc. Now, ignoring such psychological and social influence as human behavior may not be too inappropriate when we're talking about macroeconomic uh, policies. But I think we have to face that it is incomplete. And again, experience shows, uh, and enough sort of you know, evidence to that, that ignoring that fundamental factor of human behavior actually leads to misleading policy prescriptions and inappropriate institutional designs. There are overarching psychological, social, cultural, political influences on all these processes, and they, rather than the formal rules, really determine how institutions evolve and function. Thus, my second point is making space for human behavioral insights can make a big difference to better policy design and institutional processes. Third point, uh, what we have called three fellow travelers. Uh, societies, most societies, uh, well-being is shaped and influenced by what we call three principal institutions, the state, the markets, and the community. The state, obviously, must ensure security and justice for everyone, especially the weak and the marginalized. And to do that, the state, as Hobbes had said, uh, become the leviathan. Uh, that is, have the legal authority and resources to control that balance. But it is also important to see that this leviathan does not have such unbounded powers that it itself becomes the feared despot. Now that is balancing, and that is where we believe that markets play a role. Markets matter. Uh, society needs well-functioning competitive markets to enable it to efficiently produce, buy, and sell. But markets aren't perfect either. And just as the leviathan of the state has to be tamed, uh, has to be shackled, as some have called it, the behemoth of the monopoly enterprises also have to be tamed. And this is where the third traveler enters, which is the community. The community has to play that role. But again, power play comes into play. Giving community a chance to develop is not easy because one major impediment is the major asymmetry of power. The state has much more power than the individual, and therefore there has to be a process of decentralization, uh, the subsidiarity principle, and a process which is aptly called inclusive localism. The essential message is that for an effective, prosperous, caring, just society, not only must each of these institutions work well, but more importantly, they must well work well together, as if they were walking in tandem. Uh, what's more, man, much more a matter of balance rather than just the individual performances. Fourth point, uh, historical example. So we said this is all very fine, sounds good, but let's see what happens. So we studied six countries, uh, Denmark, Great Britain, Japan, Korea, Botswana, uh, and Uruguay. Uh, now, as you can see, they're divided by geography, politics, history, and culture. Their challenges, circumstances were different. But what was very interesting is, again, I'll skip through uh, uh, pressure of time. Uh, 
some very interesting common lessons emerged. In the end of feudalism in Denmark and Great Britain and land reforms in Japan and Korea empowered the common citizen to gradually demand and obtain the right of voice. Botswana's traditional so-called Kotla system served them very well in their post-colonial transition as they dealt with the dreaded curse, resource curse of their fortuitous diamond finds. Independent Uruguay for one and a half centuries was really ruled by two political parties alternating power till a third political party found this space and the civic society space was enlarged and that is when Uruguay started to move more towards this issue or this destination of Denmark. Now, again, I've given a swath of history in less than two minutes, but human capability formation was key. Empowerment, but there's no point of empowerment if people do not have the agency to manage that process. And that is where health and education comes in. And therefore, the lesson we learn, and this was a broad swath, is the need for active participation by the citizens in having adequate uh, voice, but meaningful participation would require that they also have the adequate human capital, and hence the importance of education and health in building the human agency. Uh, this is all, again, on the supply side. We also looked at the demand side for good governance, and uh, we had presented last year in Paris our book on envisioning 2060, and there were 10 global mega trends that we had talked about. And what we connected with that is that demands are trends such as growing education, particularly among the youth, gender empowerment, climate change, increased urbanization, increased middle class, all of this increased access to ICT, and of course the emerging economies, economic power growing, all of them individually and collectively provided a demand for good governance. So you also have the demand side pushing for good governance, and our feeling is that as we go along, you will have sort of more pressure for, for good governance. So what do we conclude? Uh, as you can see, we took great liberty with <laughs> our imagination. <laughs> uh, first, the journey to Denmark is a complex and time-consuming process. It took Denmark 300 years or so. It took Great Britain 700 years or so to really come from 1215 in the Magna Carta to some, certainly something more akin to Denmark, uh, really at the, uh, you know, beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, powerful vested interests will always this change, but interestingly, history tells us powerful vested interests will also compromise when the alternatives are worse, sometimes including their own heads. Creating formal uh, institutions that fit local social circumstances are time consuming, but also much trial and error, this is experimentation. So there is no one recipe of institutional strengthening. You can't borrow best practices. And I know that we all talked about best practices. It's good to draw lessons, but you can't take something which worked in country X and transplant in country Y. Time, history, culture, leadership, and luck and luck play a role, but the experiences, as I said earlier, point to two fundamental lessons which we believe drives this journey to Denmark, and that is the overriding importance of human capital and empowerment of the civil society. Uh, let's be very clear and uh, emphatic about it. The journey from here to Denmark will neither be quick nor easy. Given each country's past, their social milieu, their politics, their culture, each will have to find their own way. There is no silver bullet. 
And of course, Harinder and I, in spite of all our efforts, certainly, certainly have not come up with the last say. But we believe that that is the direction in which societies which have made it or are making it are headed. Uh, and to end, some encouragement from history. Uh, history tells us that the arc of the journey does bend towards Denmark. Uh, and we hope that uh, each country will indeed, paraphrasing Tagore, awaken to that heaven of freedom where the mind is without fear and the head is held high. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Rajat, uh, for a very concise but very uh, instructive uh, introduction of what the book tr tries to cover. It is surely a very challenging, uh, ambitious book uh, because of the weightiness of the sector that is covering. Uh, perhaps uh, most of us in, the, in, in this room uh, have been trained in economic profession, but we are talking more and more uh, out of economics, more about psychology, anthropology, or politics, and, or sociology. So it's very interesting, but uh, who else is uh, best suited than our next uh, uh, speaker, Mr. Otobayev, former Prime Minister of Kyrgyzstan, to cover these topics. Mr. Otobayev? Um, you must have had to concentrate, wrestle with economic and politics in during your time in government and beyond. Would you share with us some of your insight on these dynamics influencing institutional development? What advice would you have for us, Mr. Holbein? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Rajat and Harinder for excellent piece of work. It's another in-depth political and economic analysis of the modern world, where we are, where we are now and where we will go ahead. Uh, but um, I was asked to present a view of practitioner, the person who once upon a time have been trying to implement recommendations of uh, different think tanks and the governments. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Rajat uh, specifically asked me to make uh, kind of, if possible, critical remarks on what's going on. And I would like to uh, focus my uh, short presentation on two words. Uh, we, first of all, have the policy center of the, for the New South, who are our host, as well as we are in the 16th Emerging Markets Forum. So, what South and emerging economies countries uh, would look to the book and how they would react. Mm -hmm. With that, I would like to exaggerate kind of overall picture, also in terms of spirit of our meetings. So we need to brainstorm something which we feel to be mm -hmm. very important. And I will focus only two points on uh, on governance and institutions uh, most complicated, which Rajat also mentioned, among them political institutions, a very sensitive matter, as our chair also mentioned, uh, partly about that point, as well as combination South market communities. Um, uh, what I would like to underline is that if you observe current situation in the world. Uh, so these days, the global south has been increasingly used in context of its opposition to the global west slash north slash Denmark. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's completely clear, so that the, under the Denmark, uh, Rajat and Harinder uh, uh, understanding as a very efficient instruments and uh, institutions which lead country ahead. But these two points, pluralistic political institutions and combination of these three elements were important and contradictory currently. Uh, yes, uh, if you look to the current situation, 
look to what happened this year. Enlargement of the bloc founded by China and Russia, which is BRICS, where very influential emerging economies decided to join. You, uh, you know that among them Saudi Arabia, United Emir Emirates, and two countries in Africa, Egypt and Ethiopia. Uh, and they're practicing uh, quite different governance, institutions, arrangements in comparison with Denmark. Uh, what happened? Uh, so Denmark is considered to be as a paradise role model where everybody would move, but we see something, some movement in opposite direction. It's not black and white, but I wanted to make a little bit of, provoke a little bit more in-depth discussion. And for the second edition of your book, you may consider to look into these cases. Why things not happening? In his words, Rajat mentions specifically six countries, and what, if I am not wrong, he underlined that democratic, pluralistic institutions, sustainability movement, uh, it brought those countries to the current high status. But there are much more countries without pluralistic democratic institutions and with different perception of, of role of state performing even better in larger numbers. 100 plus countries in the global south really not willing to follow classic uh, model of liberal market economy. Uh, so this is something which we have to think and practitioner always uh, think what to do with this kind of recommendations. Many of us using the famous expression of the great hockey player, Wayne Gretzky, who said once, I skate to where the puck is going to be, not to where it has been. So at the end of the day, economic competition will be the vector, will be magnet of attracting nations and countries to drift to at the end of the day. Yeah. So this is something which every practitioner, politician should speak to the electorate, to people. People expect that their level of lives will be growing, number one. And if you look to different directions, which economy is performing better, it not Denmark. It is not with all kind of understanding that this is advanced stage, whatever. But if yeah, I'm a politician, it's quite difficult to say we have to move to the direction of Denmark. Very difficult. Because you speak to people. You don't speak to emerging market forum participants. In that respect, um, we need, in order to give practical recommendation uh, to practitioners, we need to understand these points. At the end of the day, practice is the criterion of truth. And then economic competition will be a very important element of where to move from point A to point B and where point B should be. So in that respect, uh, I specifically focus my short statement on questions, on, on priorities which you may consider to include to the second edition of your book. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Jorbaev. Your response has been very, very precise to the question that is posed. And now uh, uh, I'm welcoming Madame de la Villa, 
who will be talking about the interaction between the state and the market and the community, which the book talks about. Um, well, my questions are, according to uh, Rajat kindly prepared for me. So if, if you, anybody of the panelists don't like my questions, please blame Rajat, uh, not me. And um, to your question, uh, um, I understand you've been in a very unique position of having been each of these three travelers, and that too with several firsts. And I wonder how you have seen and dealt with the challenges of each of these travelers balancing each, uh, each other, because I really suspect it may be just wishful thinking that indeed it can balance. So the floor is yours, Madam Deputy. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Governor. Um, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for their invitation to participate in this distinguished panel, and also my sympathy to the victims of the Marrakesh recent earthquake. I applaud the authors. I am delighted. I was had really of such a good time reading what you shared with us. And it's hypothetical approach because it has allowed us, you know, in a sense to stretch our wings and not be limited by our biases as we embark on our own journey from here to Denmark. And I'll be quoting much of the book in a quest seeking good governance for all. As you mentioned, I have had the privilege of having been each of these travelers sometime or another. As state, I was foreign minister of my country, as market, I was the first woman president of a private bank in my country also. And as community, I am a member of the global board of JA. It's an NGO present in 120 countries, empowering youth through entrepreneurship and we are a Nobel Peace Prize candidate. So I have seen and dealt with the challenges of each of these travelers in balancing each other. The role of state, as you so rightly put out, at, a, at the core, it's to provide governance. So the state must ensure security and justice for everyone. But the reality is that there is a limitation in the resources that are available. So the state must either prioritize what it can do well and let the markets and society set up and address the remaining needs. Again, as you stated, the mad, mad markets do matter, and it is the society that needs them, needs well-functioning competitive markets so that we have economic growth and that we have opportunities for citizens and enhance prosperity. So, but the state must ensure that the markets work better, that we have no monopolies. But the biggest challenge to me is the community. And it is for them to be strengthened. We need to elevate its role. And this can be done through a process of decentralization, as the authors use the term localism, based on ample shared information and active participation. So let me share a personal experience to visualize the challenges of each of these travelers in balancing each other out. Our Central American countries needed an open trade framework to attract investment and increase more and better jobs. Our relation then with the US was based on the Caribbean Basin Initiative, a one-sided quota system that could be easily removed by the US. Central America needed a free trade agreement to put us on equal footing as partners. So it was the state, the first one called, to act. So as foreign ministers, we voiced the need and convinced the US to sit at the table to negotiate. But clearly, the state alone could not get the best deal for the country. If the market was not also feeding the state negotiators with the economic reality and potential for each country. So we established the room on the side with private enterprise representatives in constant communication but the state had to be vigilant of not granting special concessions to private individuals, but create a treaty with open opportunities for all. Finally, community. They wanted also to be heard. So we empowered them through consultation and information, sharing when societal issues, such as labor, was to be discussed. So we had state negotiators ready to eliminate child labor from the very start. There are many challenges. 
So several times the market and the community's expectation of the role of the state collide. Our reality regarding the limitations of the state's capacity also to negotiate, we didn't have that capacity. We were negotiating with the world's global power. The fact that every one of the travelers was convinced that their position was the most important and the one that had to prevail. So it took time, as you say, it took patience to listen to the different positions previously and agree on a national position before facing the US. I'm an optimistic and do think that these three fellow travelers indeed can reach and maintain balance, but it takes hard work. Key essentials, such as an educated and healthy population and an effective community participation by citizens in the affairs of society are positively highlighted by global megatrends also described in this book. Also in many emerging countries have established formal institutions that as the authors state, at least on paper, look fine, but how much are they truly enforced? To conclude, I see that the biggest current tasks now are how to make the existing formal institutions more effective and how to change people's beliefs and behavior so that informal societal rules better complement what the formal rules proclaim, both in writing and in spirit. I also coincide with the author's view that the future improvements in the emerging countries would most likely be driven from the bottom by communities, by youth, and by civic groups. And the secret sauce for that balance to me is to increase citizen voices and participation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you very much to the concise and uh, to the point uh, uh, response to the question posed. Uh, uh, it appeared that you did like the question posed by Rajat. And uh, we're now having uh, Mr. Son Mai, a former finance minister of Thailand. And uh, well, next to him is another speaker from Morocco. And I wonder how, why Rajat and Harinda picked up uh, UK, Denmark, and Japan. Uh, I, I wonder whether having kings or queens and emperors have any bearing on the government's issue. So, uh, Mr. Sonmai, uh, I know you, as a fi finance minister and a senior official, you have undergone many difficult times during the Asian crisis and the uh, Southeast Asian context. Uh, while Thailand has made a tremendous uh, economic d development, so what do you think of the mega trends that is described in the book, and how do you see them affecting the future of governance uh, in Thailand? In in Asia or in the world, the floor is yours, yours Mr. Soma. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, first of all, I would like to extend my thanks to uh, EMF, which invited me to join this, meet, uh, this forum and give me a chance to meet uh, on experts and, you know, distinguished uh, uh, human resources in this, this world here. And um, particularly, I would like to thank uh, Rajat Nax. You know, I, I, this date last month, <coughs> I've been working in Stockholm. I never expect that I, I, I would talk on this <laughs> book <laughs> with you. Uh, the, the, why I go there? Because I, I let the, uh, the board of directors of my organization to see how Denmark and also Norway, how can they uh, practice so so fast and so excellent <coughs> in the area of uh, ESG, ESG, which is now everybody respect ESG. And in Thailand, you know, uh, it has been, I think Thailand, everybody know the 
บิ๊กไครซิสต้มยำกุ้งอะไร something like that at that time nobody know the word good governance in my country I have to say that and it's good that I had a chance to serve the government at that time <coughs> and we decided to to uh, look over the some acts especially the Bank of Thailand Act because at that time the Prime Minister or the government they really want to sack the governor of the Bank of Thailand and the governor of the Bank of Thailand he knew that then he decided we said this is this is this is not it's not not supposed to be you know then uh, i and my boss pidiyathon tewakun i have been the chairman of the committee we draft the thing to revise bank of thailand act one clause which is very important how to prevent that thing happen any longer in thailand I talk with Bibi Athorn, and eventually we can we can think of the resolution, and then we put in one clause in the new version of the Bank of Thailand Act. That is, the government or the prime minister <coughs> can sack the uh, the the governor of the Bank of Thailand. He can they can do that, but they have to write clearly. And put in the cassette. Let all the all the all the people know that what is the reason in 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 writing, you know, and it should be published. Wow, well, this is this is this is a good 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 thing that we could uh, discover at that time. And then afterward, anyway, uh, we try to do a lot of thing. Another another act that I had a, well, I could I could participate at the same time is the revision of the of the uh, stock, uh, SEC S, SEC security uh, S, uh, exchange commission you know security uh, SEC yes. Uh, the security Exchange Commission. Uh, the Security Exchange Commission is a very big one who control private sector, especially the corporation who want to be listed in the stock exchange. And then because, because of that, the revision, we have the new version of the uh, practice that we put in the new, 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 new act that we, the government or the government agency can visit, visit uh, SRO, right, SEC, is, uh, the SRO. They can control the, uh, all the uh, corporate in the country. That is a new change for Thailand. So we would start to learn and to know about good governance since then. It, it, it has been about 16 or 17 years old. Huh? I, for in this, then then Mark, I've been there already. Now I, I would try to go back again <laughs> uh, here to Denmark. I thank uh, Richard, Rajit, th that you have already, you know, sum up and then put your ideas. I agree with all of the thing that you have been uh, saying, but let me let me let me raise the case of Thailand. And a case study on this, you know. Um, in, I, I think my belief is, my belief. I I I, I agree with Rajat that uh, the efforts to strengthen good governance in any country is very important, and it should be built on particular social social norms, as you mentioned. Uh, it should be the good understanding. Good belief, good trust. From whom? The point from whom? The very important 
one that should be encountered with this is the, the politician and the government. Because if the government doesn't want to move, nothing can be done. And during, you know, I don't want to talk the period of Obama, up to now, nine, nine and a half years, that we've been under the regime of, what do you say, uh, military regime, of course, because of the coup. And then the government, led by the general, uh, keep on talking with the, with, 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 with the Thai people. We want to be secure in this country. We want to own of our the country to be wealthy and sustainability, all the three things. But when we talk, when the private sector talk about the governance, they try to not to hear. <laughs> they try not to hear. And when we look at the practice by by the government themselves, nothing can be read can be read up at a good governance. This is this is the fact. So but in Thailand we are very quite fortunate because we have done revised FEC Act. So FEC Act is for the corporate. The one who, the uh, private sector investment, they have to do it. And somebody at is looking for them, for them, and they have to be evaluated or appraised by some institution on yearly basis or six months basis and rating them. I try to ask myself why they want to do that. They are, they, they, the private sector, they are very, uh, very glad to move forward. You know, the reason is, the main reason is, or they believe, I don't know how much. They trust, I don't know how much. But the thing that they, I know, that is the way for them to be able to mobilize <coughs> investment, mobilize fund from, you know, from you, of Hayashi Chang <laughs> from in, uh, foreign investor, foreign funds. So when they set up and, you know, uh, the corporation and be listed in the market, they expect big fund from the foreign countries. And they are successful. More than have been success, successful. And now, big corporation, PTT, Petroleum ones, uh, SCCG, you know, many, many big, big ones. They respect and they have been working hard on this. If you ask me how much Thai people in, in, in my country know a, a thing about governance, good governance, I think the people on the street, they don't know. Let's start from SME. SME is many SME, very important, but not more than half no <coughs> good governance as in, as in, uh, SMEs in Thailand. But more, more SME try to know as, uh, as, uh, good governance, try to know uh, SEG, you know, and they try to practice. But it is good that in the law, <coughs> the one who, uh, who had been uh, in the good governance, uh, practice, uh, we have to, uh, they have to practice uh, constantly, smoothly, and they should be evaluated by some institution on a timely basis. I, I, uh, let me, Let me uh, say a little bit on the uh, uh, this book. I think I think uh, uh, I've 
what I could find very fascinating is that in spite of the, uh, the wide ar array of issues and a very interesting history of six countries around the world, the authors have studied in depth as mentioned by Rajat Nat, and they have come up, come out with a very, very clear, very clear conclusion. I, I think I don't have to advise all of you to look, take a look, but I myself, I would try to read through <laughs> when, when I get back to Bangkok. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. We should all uh, read the book carefully. And now uh, we are welcoming Mr. Jaidi, Senior Fellow, Holy Sand Center for the New South, uh, located in Rabato, and um, to hear more about the African uh, perspective. And the question posed to you uh, is uh, given your past and current substantial and extensive experience and contribution. Um, may I ask you now, reflect on the two fairly fundamental policy prescriptions that are offered by Rajat and Arinda, please. Thank you, Mr. President. I will speak in French, if I may. It's not my mother tongue, but I'm more fluent in French than in English, and therefore I would like to give you my reflection as clear as possible. If I may, I gather there is interpreting in the room. We are talking about a complex and interesting topic. The topic reflected in the uh, this book the relationship between formal and informal rules in the development of governments and societies and how do we attempt to reach a perfect model with robust institutions taking into account the specificities and experience of uh, these uh, countries mentioned in the book. When we reflect upon these institutional issues, we always uh, mention that the South, the global South, has its own history. It doesn't start from scratch. We aspire to reach a model of democracy, respect for individual, the rule of law, Denmark is a model, but we all know that in the trajectory of societies, each one can learn from the others. Why do I say this? Because this issue has been long discussed in the Global South, not only in Morocco, and it has been viewed from different angles. For example, some sociologists especially in Europe, and I'm thinking of the work undertaken by Bertrand Stanz. He's a sociologist, a French sociologist, who wrote a book about the imported state. The imported state meaning the reality of global of the global south can the westernization of those countries be a solution for the development of those countries in the south as in here in morocco there were other suggestions about this topic meaning the dynamics of societies the concept of the mixed society. And this is the situation we're in, meaning that uh, there are many orders coexisting within a single society. Several legal orders, Sharia, 
customary law. There are many sources of law. But even society in its attitudes is mixed because there are several different uh, cultural references. And I can mention other books, one of the latest that uh, I was very much interested in, Ali Mizrahi, a Tunisian author, on the incomplete state, meaning a state that is seeking a an established order based on law and rules in society, but that is facing a certain number of failings because of uh, its historical trajectory. Bernard Badi, uh, I remember now his name, uh, who worked on the westernization of uh, societies in the South. I think this is a, a very important uh, issue. that brings us to ponder about uh, the what, what is the point of wealth if it doesn't lead to social well-being. So how do we go about, through growth, how do we go about to redistribute this wealth, not only through access to material goods, but also to social services, access to well-being, and this is a very complex notion. And this brings us to reflect upon institutions. The term institutions is also very complex. It can be viewed in a certain variety of ways. It uh, describes the formal rules that govern human interactions, according to Douglas Nott. But there are other more narrow definitions that focus on the transparency of bodies, regulations, procedures, the quality of uh, government uh, management, uh, rules that protect uh, private property, etc. But North, as other sociologists, expect that uh, there is no guarantee that institutions will be efficient or that they will be capable of producing growth and re redistributing it the right way. On the contrary, history tells us that institutions, even when they are inefficient, can produce a high degree of wealth. And as a consequence, we need to focus on capital, especially on social and human capital. If we get back to the notion of human capital, which is decisive in the creation of institutions, but also in the uh, in taking ownership of the rules between governments and uh, people, in that uh, rules should be respected. In economic theory, there is a narrow definition of this, meaning the skills, the knowledge, knowledge of people, capacities, but we're not robots. The notion of human capital is m much broader than this because it needs to reflect the behavior of people, what lies behind people. Knowledge uh, would all, only be a stock. We would be uh, robots, and this has been mentioned several times. So what educational system should be in place in our countries? Should it be an educational system that uh, improves programs and trainings to adapt it to the labor market and that reflects uh, technology developments? Yes, but on, not only the educational system should reflect a comparative analysis of cultures and religions to avert the tensions we're witnessing now in the world. In many countries of the North and the South, the comparative analysis of religions is not part of the curricula, whereas it could be a factor of dialogue and uh, that will allow to bridge the gaps. Another aspect that was mentioned by the chair, 
how do we ensure that citizenship becomes one of the most important values of our institutions because it's based on social cohesion and stability. The issue of citizenship brings us back to a, a notion of government, which is not the Leviathan, albeit uh, a, a role of uh, authority and order, but it, government should protect. It should protect the, no, the standards and values that ensure the non-concentration of wealth. Wealth should not be concentrated within the hands of the few, and hence the importance of the individual to respect a certain number of standards and regulations. And today, the crisis of democracy, whether it be in the north or in the south, is very concerning. The rules of democracy are being taken hostage by the media and finance, and this is detrimental to free expression, free speech. So there should be less technocracy, less political, and those rules that I mentioned should be respected. One last point I would like to mention, formal or informal institutions. When we question history, it tells us that the references, the cultural references, are the same. But it, it depends on how we interpret those values. So today in the Mediterranean, for example, there is talk about shared values to ensure shared prosperity. Yes, but shared values, the rule of law, democracy, etc., are viewed from several different angles. The dialogue on shared values and shared history is not deepened enough, is not reflected upon enough in our societies. Hence, the conflicts and tensions in our societies, and there are conflicts within states themselves as a consequence. One of the important dimensions upon which this relationship between formal and informal institutions and the organization of societies should be based is trust. And this notion was not mentioned enough. Trust between people, trust uh, between communities, and institutional trust that allows institutions to retain their credibility vis-a-vis -vis the public so that people don't reject them, so that they don't say they're not representative of the common interest. So the notion of trust, to me, is critical in our cultures and in our dialogue to step out of this opposition between formal and informal rules, formal and informal standards. Thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much, Mr. Jaidi, for new and uh, interesting perspectives. Well, finally, uh, we have our last speaker, Mr. Jani, who is executive director and board member, Mo Ibrahim Foundation. And as you are the president of African Governors Institute, uh, you, are, uh, you have much to respond to. Would you be um, kind enough to share your experiences with us? And would you be bold enough to, to tell us who are the successes and who are the failures? Uh, Mr. Johnny, please. You don't mind I do it from here? Oh, okay. I, 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 I feel so bad I don't want everybody to see me so I can hide here. You know, I, I was told that my session was at half past two this afternoon. And therefore, I had a commitment. And, and I was told I could go to that commitment in 20 minutes. It took me 40 minutes to get there. So I am here, ruffled, without my notes. And I, if I'm incoherent, please tell me that I am. You know. But this is something very close to my heart. Uh, my life, this is, I've been involved in promoting governance. And therefore, I am 
I'm obliged to do so, but uh, so, so please forgive me if, as I say, if I'm incoherent. Let me first start by really um, saluting really the, the movement all over the world to really promote governance. Governance, good governance. Uh, governance that will ensure the uh, peaceful transfer of power, that will ensure uh, credible and transparent uh, gov uh, governments that respect the fundamental rights, among other things. And in that context, as I said, there is really universal recognition of the importance of promoting governance. And in that respect, I want to salute Harinda and, uh, and his team, who over the past years, every year we come, there's something on governance. There's something on governance in Africa. Is it because we have we had the worst continent in the world in terms of respect? That I do not know. But this is a separate conversation with Harinda. But but I'm I'm I am I am happy to, to be here. And as I said, this this desire for good governance, this desire to create uh, credible institutions and so on, is also is very much it's universally shared, but very much so in Africa, given our past history of of, of democratic rule and so on. Currently, this wave of supporting and advocating and practicing of governance is, is very much on the agenda, very high on the agenda in almost every African country. It is also, uh, Africa has also come together in the formation of, of, of the African Union. And it is the African Union that's really driving this agenda by, by putting in place legal instruments that bind every African country. And you know, in, in Africa, the African Union is, is, is overseeing 54 different countries. So finding consensus on things is, is, is very difficult. But the issues of governance, there is really increasingly uh, a common understanding of, of where our failures are and, and what is it that we are, we are supposed to do. So if you take some of the initiatives we have at the continental level, one of them, is the Charter on Democracy and Elections, Democracy, Governance, and Elections. It was difficult putting that together, but the African countries come together and agree on this. So it is there. It is what is really driving, drive, driving, driving, dri driving this, this, uh, this, this agenda. And um, in doing so, they hold the feet of governments to, to, to fire to say these are the norms now, this is what you should follow. If you don't, there are, there are repercussions. And uh, it's working reasonably well, but I'm not sure really we have the power to really to, to push countries to respect some of the norms that we have set. One of the, one of the examples is, is, um, is limitations to mandates of, of presidents. You know, normally the charter says two mandates. So if you do two mandates, you already are. We have advocated for this. Most countries respect it, but some countries don't. And what happens if you, you know, you have no, no punitive action to take against them and so on. So on the other time, we continue to refine this and uh, and push for the respect of this 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 fundamental pillar of governance. It's um it's something that um, uh, that we continue to work on. On on this score, of course, I would say. Do not hold only African governments to, to, to hold them responsible for moving this agenda because there are other countries, you know, who really also don't have limitations of power. United States, I know, is one that has, but in some of the European countries, there is none. If you're if an English prime minister, unless your, your, your party pushes you out, you can still move several times. In Germany, it's the same. Chancellor Merkel did 16 years as Chancellor and so on. So those examples are there. But really in Africa, we believe in term limitation and really we, are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we continue to, 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 to push that. The, the, the African Union also created uh, arrangements, institutions, which are really trying to push the respect of some of these fundamental rights. Um, one of them is the Peace, the Peace and Security Council of the African Union, which um, tries to minimize the impact 
of, um, of, of, of insecurity in the, in the continent. It's, um, it's a tall order, it is not easy, but every time there's, 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 there's enough uh, problems of security, they meet, they meet uh, regularly. They also, uh, through that council, discourage the unconstitutional changes of government. And if you, if, 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 um, if, if, if such desirable uh, occurrences there, they would suspend you. They would suspend the given country from membership of the African Union. It has it worked well? You ask me successes? I don't think so. If you are a West African, I, I am. Look at what is happening now in, in several of these West African countries where we have moved and government and so on. So it is, it is, it is a tall order for us. It is a disturbing development that the military or any other uh, power can, can change a democratically elected government with, with minimal ability on our part to bring them to order. As I said, you could put sanctions on them and so on, but given the multipolar world in which we are, they always find ways of, of moving. So this is a, a, another, uh, it, it's, a desirable, it's a desirable development, but I say implementing it, it uh, poses, poses challenges for us. This is, this is, and there are many other, um, um, many other uh, uh, developments, many other institutional arrangements that the African Union is posing. They are fighting against corruption. Now they have, uh, they want responsible and accountable governments and so on. And therefore, the issues of corruption and so on are center stage. They have summits on, 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 on the corruption and so on. So this is what is happening at, um, at, the, at, the, at the continental level. The same is, is, is being pushed at the sub-regional level because, as you know, Africa has um, five sub-regions and each of them have their their own, um, their own um, sub-regional uh, institutions, and this mirror what the African Union is doing. There, some of the decisions taken by the African Union are brought down to the sub-regional institutions, and they are pushing the same agenda. They are on the same page, and they meet regularly. Of course, then, where they say the rubber hits the wall is, is at the national level. At the national level, but before I go to the national level, let me let me also say amongst the amongst the, uh, the developments, amongst the institutions, amongst the practices that are being encouraged at the continental level is the uh, peer review mechanism. The peer review mechanism is unprecedented in this world. This is where uh, the, the African governments got together and said we would, we would make uh, governments be reviewed by their peers, heads of state be reviewed by their peers. They, they go into a given country and say, what is the state of governance? You open your books and to determine what the state of governance is, is not done externally, it's done at the country level. We are really all, 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 all components of the state are there, the political parties are there, there are private sectors there and so on. And they, 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 they prepare a national report, which is then subjected to the review, and then is you know based on, on the on the comments of that. And as I say, based on the, the, the assessment by by the missions that come, they assess what the country has said. This is where we are now. As I say, it's unprecedented. Nobody opens their book. No country in the world, apart from those in Africa, open op, open their books in, in such a manner. So it's going on. Um, many missions now, and it was voluntary accession. Now, out of 54 countries, 42 or 44 are, are members of this, of, of, this, of this mechanism, and they do it, and regularly these assessments are continued. They've created a panel of, 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 of personalities. I chair that panel uh, that, that uh, pushes this uh, push, pushes this agenda. As I say, it is a credible development. It's, um, it's inspirational. The problem, of course, that we have is that once you, you decide what your national priorities are, or what you need to do to improve governance, it's a humongous task. 
even for me in terms of availability of resources. And this is one of the shortcomings which I want to highlight. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, I, don't know. I remember the, one, of the first, um, one of the first reviews that we made was in Ghana, it was Ghana. And then there was President Kufo who came and said, listen, we've done a credible uh, uh, plan of action. We have subjected it to a review by our peers and other external um, uh, parties. But he says it costs a lot. He said, I have made my national budget in, in, uh, that conforms to what, uh, that conforms and tries to meet the challenges that, um, that, uh, this, uh, that nationally we agree that these are the challenges to improve governance. But it cost me a lot. He said, just to put my judiciary together and make it a credible judicial system, I need a billion dollars. And then if you look at all the other challenges that are there, so who would, who would, who would, where would the resources come from? And he said, when we were putting this together, this was our idea, but it was, it was supported and encouraged by our partners who said, do this and we will move the implementation together. Up to now, that support is minimal. So really, if we, if we congratulate ourselves, if we feel this is a success putting it together, implementing it continues to be really a, 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 huge, a huge challenge. So having said that, let's look at what's happening at the national level. At the national level, it varies. It varies from some, some countries that are pushing the governance agenda and others who are already falling back. I, I, uh, apart from my membership of the peer review mechanism, I also have up to now been working with the Mo Ibrahim Foundation. This is a, a privately funded foundation that looks at the state of governance in Africa every year. And they look at it from the point of view of the citizen, which says governance is really the delivery of those goods and services that the citizens expect from their government. And so they, they, they put up, they said, we should look at this. We will provide data on four, four, uh, four pillars. One is security. One is um, rule of law. Another is participation and, 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 and human rights. There is also the issue of human development, with issues of health and so on, that the citizens are good one and other others. And it's this complaint. So these are the pillars, and these pillars have several indicators that we have. Getting the data, of course, is a challenge. It costs a lot to call, and the data, this data is not, is not it's not emanating from most government because in Africa the whole question of data continues to be a challenge. And really, if you want to review whether it's governance or anything, you must have credible data. What I do is I go to some of these countries and look at what the index says you are doing. What the index says these are the successes you are doing in terms of promoting government, uh, promoting promoting uh, uh, governance. And uh, we always I always tell them. It's not the condemnation of your efforts. It is, uh, it is, uh, it is it's like a, uh, a dashboard which says you're doing well in terms of participation. You are organizing elections, but you are failing other places. So let us look at it in a very consensual manner and we bring civil society and others to look at it. And then those governments that want to take land from this and push it are doing so. There are others who are recent because one of the one of the challenges we have is that we have ranked the countries from number one to number 54. And governments that see themselves low, it's like a league table, will tell you, oh, because you feel I'm doing so badly, I'm not interested in talking to you. I'm not interested in reviewing you. So we, it's, a, it's a humongous task, convincing them that, in fact, the idea is not to name and shame. The idea is really to capture the reality of, what, yes, reality of what's happening. I, I consider it really one of the credible instruments that have, we have in Africa in trying to assess the state of governance in, uh, in any, any, any given country. It's still a work in progress, but more and more, uh, it's, it, more and more countries are adhering to it. But I'm hoping that 
they would they would they would improve the their databases, you know, their data on the critical elements that, that we should use to judge the state of governance, apart from the peer review mechanism, which is really between. But at the national level, this 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 issue should continue to do it to be to, to be pushed. As I said more and more are uh, here. In fact, I was a meeting. I was in a meeting on the index when I was told that instead of half past two, it is no, it's nine nine forty five. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yes, so that's, that's why that's, uh, but I hear that I have little time since I came in late. I accept that uh, my time will be cut. But again, what I want to do is that the commitment, the desire by the citizens of, 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 of African continent and the, and the continental, sub-regional, and, con and, and national level really are pushing. I will not, I don't know whether we should say hooray there's success or there's failure. It is, it is, it is in between. It is in between, and, uh, but we'll continue to push and we hope that we'll have a democratic and progressive continent in the, in the very near future. Can I, maybe I should stop here. Thank you very much. And again, I apologize for coming late. Well, thank you very, very much, Mr. John. I know all the time constraints, uh, we are very, we've been very happy to have your voice from Africa. Well, uh, we are now already at lunchtime, but uh, from the audience, uh, is, is there anybody kind enough or bold enough to, to make an intervention now? Yes, please. <laughs> thank you very much. I commend Rajat and Tarin for taking up such a uh, challenging and pressing uh, issue and uh, writing and publishing a book about it. And I really admire their optimism. Uh, it's not a joke, I, I mean it. Because you need optimism to get things going. Uh, so this is really important. But I, I have to admit that I am less optimistic. Um, I mean, it has been some examples of bad governments that we've experienced in the recent years have already been mentioned. Um, and, but I would like to uh, bring in a theoretical aspect. I don't want to challenge the assertion that there is a increasing demand for good governance. But in my view, the catch is the supply of good governance. Good governance is a, it is a, what economists call a public good, in the sense that once that it is produced and provided, everybody can benefit from it, everybody can consume it. You cannot exclude anybody from uh, enjoying the benefits of good governance. And you cannot force anybody to pay for it. And therefore, there is an insufficient supply of good governance. That's the fundamental economic problem. And what makes things worse and the way to Denmark more thorny is that you cannot delegate the production of good governments, or only you can delegate it only partially, because ultimately the citizens have to make a personal effort to produce this governance and to, to keep the mighty in check. So the bottom line is, if you look at the uh, Depion that has been handed out before the session, and have in mind that Denmark is at sea level, you could think that we're talking about a downstream journey. But I believe it's an uphill battle. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So because of the time plans, could I ask Mr. Campo for the final comment for the session? And wrapping up the discussion is in, in, in instead of me. <laughs> First, I congratulate my friend Rajat and my dear friend Harinder for such a uh, interesting book. I just uh, 
if I had some misgivings, I'm not too sure it, it would have been, uh, you, you, you might say, uh, uh, helpful to identify one country because to some extent you fall into the rankings game, who are the happiest countries and so forth and so on. And they, are, they have different structures. Denmark has seven million people. That is one half the population of Manila. That is like a one, one, less than a fourth of the population of Delhi. So how do you take into account the management of a larger corp a group of people? It's easy enough to say let's have robust institutions. But the ratio between institutions and people being managed in a country like Denmark is far lower than when, when you're dealing with uh, larger groupings. That's not to excuse them. It's just to suggest that perhaps you might want to not single out one country, but group countries by different criteria and have maybe different models. The, the other thing I was wondering is whether governance, when, when, when you brought it out, has to do just with the public sector or the private sector as well. Because the whole subject matter of governance, good governance, even the phrase, came to the fore because of bad governance in the private sector in the United States. The first one was the Enron crisis. Everybody thought it was a great corporation, and then it wasn't. Then came the 2008 financial crisis when the likes of uh, the, the biggest financial corporations went down the drain. And therefore, all sorts of things were, were uh, suggested. In fact, uh, one, one of the things that, that, that came up was the establishment of the so-called global reporting initiative in order to come up with criteria by which corporations were supposed to judge more than just the financial bottom line. So if we're talking about the private, maybe that's, that's the way to go. If we're talking about the public side of governance, yes, I agree, um, robust institutions, but one institution, or maybe almost all-encompassing philosophy, is leadership by example. And when you think about leadership by example, the other question that arises is, how do you identify or elect these leaders? In some instances, the election process, like some Western societies, is a marketing game. In order to be elected to be a congressman of a so-called democratic society, you'd be lucky if you needed only $500,000 to get elected. And where will you get it? You'll get it from patrons. And there you are with the seeds of corruption. And you can say all you want about you know, the Bureau of this and the Department of that, but when the whole process begins, with a selection of leaders by means of money rather than qualifications, you've got a problem. And these are just suggestions perhaps that you can begin to look into because I can't, I can't help but look forward to your second volume and, uh, and see if these things can also be incorporated in them. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very, very much. And um, well, I understand you have more questions and comments, but uh, because of the time is limited, uh, Rajat, would you want to respond to uh, speakers or comments? Can I go there? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Before that, uh, Hanshu, may I just see you for a minute, please? Here. Uh, First of all, thanks very much to, to all of you, the chair and the discussants. Uh, those were excellent points. Uh, some of them we wrestled with, but I think Harinder will agree that Harinder, instead of thinking of them as being our panel members towards the end of the book, we should have talked to them right at the beginning of the book and <laughs> got all of these inputs. Uh, but first of all, thanks very much. All of them were very, very useful. 
Uh, but having there also, I get a clear sense that the forum has given us marching orders for the second edition. So maybe starting tomorrow morning? <laughs> but, uh, you know, th these are excellent points. Uh, let me, and I'm not going to answer any of them because they're all very relevant. Uh, some of them are in the book. The issue of trust that you mentioned uh, is, is a major issue, very true. Uh, we have talked about it. Uh, what I would say is something that launched our work to begin with is really a question that, Hassan, you raised for another session, that we've talked enough, enough about why, and you were talking about in the context of private sector financing. Our effort is here now to help ourselves about how and what to do. So therefore, why the issue that you talk about typology, all of them are, all of them are very important. Uh, uh, I would like to mention, Zuma, just one point, that in the book, we do make a point about there is no unique Denmark either. Just as there are many parts, we've said each country will choose its own Denmark in a way. So some of the points that you raise, which are very relevant, about what choices a society will make is not something we wrestled with, because that's what we, all that we're saying is, whatever you have decided as your Denmark, how do you get there? And there are some sort of common elements we found, like education, health, uh, empowerment, huh? so all of that. Uh, so I don't think I'll even, even try to respond to these excellent points. They're all very good. We'll certainly take them on board. Uh, again, I, I don't know when we'll start, but obviously there is a demand for it. The other thing I would say is that now that you've given these excellent comments, be prepared for us to pester you with more questions. So you know you haven't got away scot free by making these comments. We'll come to you and seek your help and guidance. I was particularly struck by uh, your points about some of the literature in the South, which you know I must confess we had not access to, and there will obviously be much more, much more there. So. On behalf of Harinder and me again, thank you very, very much for all your thoughts and comments and suggestions. And I end with essentially returning the compliment to Werner. Werner was one of our original inspirers. And though he says he's less optimistic, he's one of the most optimistic people I know because he egged us on to do this. And uh, yeah, it is laced with optimism, but I hope also some sense of realism as we as we have gone along. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield it back to you. <laughs> uh, thank you very, very much, Rajat, and thank you very much, all the uh, panel members. And now we are going to the uh, official launch of the book. Harinda, please. Yes, Harinda, has to join us here. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now honored to announce the launch of the EMF book titled From Here to Denmark, The Importance of Institutions for Good Governance by Rajat Nag and Harinder Kohli. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now break for lunch and invite you all to join us at the restaurant's area. The Policy Center for the New South colleagues, who are in White Lanyard, will guide you to it. At 1.15 sharp, we will meet again in this auditorium for the remaining sessions of the evening.